Nostalgic America, 1962. What about the 400 females in the sophomore class with even some freshmen thrown in whom I was never in class with? Well, I'd run into them all, one way or another, such as at sock hops and football games, hadn't I? What with the school divisions, the fact that some females were just bland or slovenly, too religious, already taken or whatnot, the pool had been drastically reduced. My new and higher standards born from my good luck, possibly even subconsciously placing more reductions upon. I didn't want to be in any old average type of relationship, for I had noted many of those, and they weren't all that worth it. Nor was it likely, if I even could somehow qualify, to be walking three to four miles to North Oak Park or River Forest for a relationship, regardless of their higher class. Lois Gamboni had come out on top and she lived in a nearby section of South Oak Park, but quite near to Joe Gaynor, and he had already romanced her. He had to have had, and her sister. He had to have had, and her sister. He told me to go ahead though, since he had his eye on a Christine a few blocks away, and sure enough, he went straight off to walk over there, sight unseen, to ring her doorbell and ask her to hang out or such. Bob Toner, Christine's current love interest and classmate at St. Bernardine's, saw me at the pool one day and asked me about my friend, Joe Gaynor. I said that he was a very good guy. Hey Joe? Joe asked me still. What about Lois? This still seems awkward, Joe. Are you sure? She's a prize. It's too close to home, Pat. I wouldn't have much freedom. I don't know, Joe. She probably loves you since you're very likable. You are too. I'll pass, I guess. For you two might really get going again, she being right next door and all. Yeah, maybe, but her sister Joyce is my favorite. Well, we had both goofed. Both of us should have married then. Such is life, but at least we were still the best of friends. One day, Cindy Rose came up to me, looking all loving and serious. She was gorgeous, but was at the bottom of the list, for she went with anyone and everyone at the same time. The tales of her exploits were all over town and the school. One day, she caught up to me walking home near Madison Street where she lived. She wanted me to give her a ring so we could go steady. I said, no, I'm seeing someone. Who? Myself, in the mirror. I bided my time, and actually I was pretty busy with non-romantic rings. I'd gotten a job on the weekends, too, at the end of my street at A&H Fasteners, putting away packages of nuts, bolts, screws, and all kinds of fasteners. They had a joke sign of a lady nut and a man bolt heading into each other. She's saying, no, not without a washer. Winter had continued on, even into April, but not into May. Joe had a friend, Kurt, a gymnast, down and over a block on Gunderson Avenue, and so we began going over there to play pool. Kurt's sister, Beverly, a freshman, played with us, and they, brother and sister, talked all about gymnastic moves and meets, meaning tournaments, and a so-called gymnastic club in Berwyn. Ask Beverly out. You've kissed her, haven't you, Joe? Well, yeah, but that's about all. What am I going to do with you, Joe? Well, she's very pretty. Their whole life is about gymnastics. Yeah, true. They taught me how to do a handstand. I've even done it on the high diving board at Forest Park Pool. I'll show you this summer, so... No, Beverly? I think I'll wait on it. Well, the next six on my top ten list were already taken. But I had put them there, but not others taken, just so I'd know what I was missing. My policy, though, was never to try to take a girl away from her boyfriend. I brought happiness to the world, not misery. It's not that I was picky, although I guess I was, but I had been to the mountaintops. What about just seeing someone for something to do? I would give my all, of course, or try, even with my heart not fully in it. But sometimes these things then go on and on. And then you don't really want to shatter a heart that you shouldn't have led on in the first place.
And then there was personality to be considered, which I had categorized, much like the Myers-Briggs personality profiles would go on to do. I could do extroversion and well when needed, but I was never one to perform for a faceless audience. I didn't act in plays, although I could have, it's just that the rehearsals would kill all of my time and also that I didn't want to, which meant that it was something which would take energy away, not add it. Give me one on one or one on a few, those few being people that I knew. I had plenty of intuition as well, but also being sensing, such as with sports, so call it a near tie, but in favor of intuition, for I never got into playing the piano or the violin. Plus, sports had aspects of intuition to it. I felt things deeply, but thought a lot as well, school and reading having greatly deepened my thinking aspect as it may in anyone. The preference had to go to feeling, though. Was I orderly or perceptive? Well, order was useful when it had to be, and so I wasn't messy, but neither did I have to plan out my whole day, such as my mother would always try to do for us all. I was a writer, and as an artist I was naturally spontaneous. Every darn thing didn't need closure, but for when one didn't want something hanging over their head. I didn't know it then, but INFP types are just 2% of the population. I only vaguely felt somewhat apart from the crowd, but I was fine with it. Turns out, though, that this 2% writes most of the novels, screenplays, poems, and TV shows. Why? Because they understand every other type and can thus portray them. I crossed off Linda McElroy. She had been Lucille's friend, plus she had a dark streak. I peeked at her breasts once after a date and she had cried. Her friend, Ruth Bard, found out and started giving me a bad name around town, so I threw her purse up into a tree. Not my best day. Linda later took up with a guy from the pool hall and I thought, good for them, I'm no longer tempted. I danced with a girl from North Oak Park at a sock hop, and she seemed really strange. After it was over, she hung around with me outside and wanted me to walk her home, for safety reasons. Well, everyone our age walked everywhere, for we couldn't get driver's licenses yet, and it was safe. Incidents were so infrequent and far between that we didn't really know of any. I went part way with her, and then told her I lived in the complete other direction. At school, she presented me with a notebook that had my name written in it 10,000 times, which had taken her a week to do. This wasn't going to work out, I told her, and she was sad. Better to say it now rather than later. Well, she was really rather strange in a scary kind of way. Peggy Heartless's father had died at work, he having fallen into some kind of mixing machine and they were going to have to move far away. She lived only one street over on Wisconsin Avenue and was ever a part of our local gang, she now having grown into a very sharp girl. I reluctantly crossed her off, although still daydreaming that I could travel far and be with her in her misery. We had stolen many youthful and playful kisses way back. Both of my grandmothers and one of my grandfathers had died in the last few years too, but at least they were over 60. I thought of Karen's death which had jolted me to my foundation, as well as Lucille's mother's passing. My list had grown short. I considered Joanne Tucker, who was in my homeroom. She was deeply religious, ever telling us that God did this and God did that. Why was she on the list? Well, she was spectacular. I quickly crossed her off.